Good morning. I want to welcome you to Good Shepherd Free Lutheran Church this morning for worship. If you're a visitor, we are thankful that you're here and that if you would let us know, uh, sign your name in a little card in the pew there or talk to Pastor Rob or myself. And uh, we're glad to have you here worshiping with us. There aren't many announcements that I win, I'm going to uh, point out, but the one I, I do want to make sure I do mention is that there is no softball this afternoon. The uh, decision was made because of the potential rain, <laughs> and then as soon as you say there isn't any softball, then it turns out to be a beautiful day, right, Mike? <laughs> so... <clears throat> Right now, there is no softball, no tournament, and it's postponed until next week. Next, same time next Sunday. Right. Okay. Thank you, Tom. All right. Uh, the other thing I want to uh, point out in the bulletin is that the early bulletin deadline for this next Sunday's bulletin is Monday because Mike and Monica are heading off to Knoxville, Tennessee to, more, to move Morgan down there for her new job. Um, so, other than that, I'll leave you to the announcements that you see in the bulletin. Oh, and the other thing is, for confirmation, for those of you who do have those who are going into 7th, 8th grade, the junior and senior confirmation, there's a sign-up in the entryway if you would put your name down so we don't miss anyone. All right. Let's uh, read the psalm that's for today. It's in your bulletin. Psalm 139 is our call to worship. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be in and through this service today, that your name would be lifted up and glorified and given the praise, and that you would be in and through all aspects of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. During the offertory, if we have any children or all the children that were involved with the VBS, if they would come forward and we could do those songs and uh, give you a taste of what we experienced this past week. We would appreciate that. Let's open our, our opening hymn, if you would stand. And number 228 in the red hymnal, I will sing of my Redeemer.
You may be seated. Now we'll have our praises and prayers and petitions. Lori. Get there. <laughs> okay, Lori, unspoken request. Also, I'm going to add the uh, persecuted church and travel safety for the Bergs, Monica, Mike, and uh, Morgan as they travel to Knoxville, Tennessee on Tuesday. I'd like to pray for the, the kids who are in the children's hospital. Okay. They die in real bad. Right. Children in the children's hospital. Right. Annika. Um, to pray for um, Kathy's um, dad. Um, he's not doing so well. Just pray for his healing. And he had a stroke on Thursday. Okay. The third stroke he's had. So. Okay. So do we know his name? Bill. Bill. Okay. So Kathy's dad, Bill, has had strokes. He just had another one. So pray for healing. Okay. Barb? Prayers for our cousin Dickie. Dickie? Dickie. Okay. He's going to have uh, MRI and a stress test to see if he is a candidate for the heart uh, procedure. All right. So pray for Dickie, who is, is going through MRI and stress testing to see if he's a candidate for heart procedure. And he's a cousin. Okay. <laughs> Alan. Um, next Sunday, David's going to be installed up in Greenwood. And so pray for the blessing for his work up there and the venue and also uh, safe travels for us and everybody else that's going up and the heart attack. Thank you. Okay, so David Nimala is being installed next Sunday in his church. Uh, safe travels. Pray for Jenny and family and for the Von Olins going up. Are the Nimalas going up too? Okay. All right. Okay. Mike. All right. All right. Mike and Linda have been married for 50 years on August 3rd. August 2nd. Okay. That's right. Yeah. I know. Mine put up with me for quite a few years too, so we're thankful for them, aren't we? <laughs> All right, so prayers and praise for that anniversary. Okay, Kenny, or Dave. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pray for Glenn Mork and his work as in the Hope Centers for Children of Africa. Oh, and then praise that he is home safely. He just arrived this past week. Because uh, from what I heard, it's hard for him to get around there because of the Ebola. They keep limiting where he can go. So, Yep. Praise for the VBS, ongoing fruit that is planted there. That was a, a fantastic time. I was my first opportunity working with that, so really thankful for that outreach. Any others? Tom. Okay, Ashley with colon cancer, that was successful. This so, but sip. Yeah, so chemo in September, pray for that. Anything else? It's her birthday today. Oh my, Jody's birthday. Oh, yeah, there you go. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jody. May Jesus bless you. I know. Can't help it. The choir director's got to start something. So. <laughs> Getting rusty after being out of commission all summer. So, is there anything else? All right. Let's bring these to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so in awe of you, the power that you have to see vast things of history and of universe and the creation that we are surrounded by and even the intricateness of our own bodies and cells that we can't even see. And yet you are so intricately involved in all of that. Your hand your, has touched all of it. You are the creator God of all that we can see that's visible and invisible. And you're powerfully working in it to this moment and, and will continue. You do not leave us. You did not create the world and go away, but became a part of it and even to the point of becoming becoming a human being, sending your son, fully man, fully God, to touch us, to talk with us, to be among us, so that we could relate to you and not be fearful of you. And you loved us so much, even though we were enemies and were hostile to you and alienated, and because of your death and resurrection, you have wrapped your arms around us in that great, great love. So that's why we bring these things to you. We ask for safety in traveling, for Monica and Mike and Morgan when they're going to Knoxville to move Morgan down there, and just pray for that new job, that it would be uh, a place where Morgan can continue to witness of your wonder and your power and your might in, in this world. We thank you that you are with those in the persecuted church, those who are suffering to be your witnesses wherever they are placed, that they put you first. They count the loss of family or possessions or friends to be only a minor setback, that you be ultimately glorified in all that is said and done. Pray for Bruce Rockala and the surgery that he had on his back this past week and that you would continue to work in healing. Um, we lift up before you those who are have unspoken requests, those things that gnaw on us, that hurt us, that draw us to that point of not knowing how to even put it into words or that it is something we feel so sensitive about, that we want, we know that you take care of these things, that you are not one who is um, uncaring, unfeeling, but as a great high priest, you hear all these things and you you pray and work and answer. We lift up before you those children who are in the children's hospitals and other hospitals around the area for healing, for comfort, for your presence in their life, for those who can come alongside wherever they are to bring your good news and truth. We lift up before you Bill, uh, Kathy's dad who has had strokes and has had another one, just praying for healing. We always lift these prayers and requests before you knowing that it is by your will and by your power that we lay these before you, knowing that sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is to be waiting, to have patience. And, and other times we are miraculously praising you for the healing that does happen. We lift up before you Dickie, uh, Barb's cousin, having an MRI and a stress test to see about a new heart procedure, we just lay, you, lay it before you because you're the one who is the great physician and you are the one who leads and guides in these situations and provides the medicine or procedures that are available now. Uh, we are thankful for David Niemela and for Jenny and up in Greenbush and that you would be with that installation next Sunday and all those who are traveling 
that it would again bring, bring honor and glory and praise to your name as, he, as David and Jenny serve up there. Give you thanks and praise for anniversaries and for birthdays, uh, times of remembering how far we have come in this short time that we are here on earth and that it is all by your hand that we are protected and provided for and given a joy of celebrating those accomplishments, but always remembering it is by only you that we make it to that point. We don't do it on our own. We thank you for uh, Glenn and Sherry and their work with the Hope Centers in Africa, and thank you that praise that uh, Glenn made it home safely. We thank you for the Bible, Vacation Bible School and all the ministry that went on there and the words and your truth being proclaimed and also the money that was raised also for Hope Center's uh, clean water project and that the kids were able to be enthusiastic and participating in that. We thank you for your presence here and uh, also for being with Ashley and that colon cancer that the surgery was successful and in your wisdom uh, giving the doctors the knowledge they need and those preparing the chemo and things for this September, that they would be able to be motivated, moved, and used by you to uh, heal that uh, Ashley, heal Ashley. Again, we lift up before thee these things, knowing that it is only by your hand, that it is your strength, your power, and your plan is sometimes so much different than ours. And we are so thankful that your perfect plan is the one is put in place. Your will is done. Uh, whether we fight it or not, but that you are in ultimate control. Help us to rest in that knowledge of your power and your might. In Jesus' and holy and precious name, amen. Call on uh, Marlon to come up and read scripture. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word in reverence. Morning. Good morning. Today's first lesson is found in Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 through 23. Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 through 33. <clears throat> then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see what they have done, if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from, from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city because of the five people? If I find forty-five there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him. What if only forty are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. 
What if only ten can be found there? He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. New Testament lesson is found in Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Luke 11, 1 through 13. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each daily, day our daily bread. Forgive our sins, for we also forgive everyone, everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though you will not, give, not get up and give you give." him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will, not, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, fathers, if your, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give, to the, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This ends the readings. Let's confess our faith in the words of the Apostle Creed, found on, found on page 105 in your blue hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Call on the ushers. And then the kids can come up too at that point. Oh. <laughs> See, I'm still on vacation Bible school. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gifts that you give to us so richly and lavishly. You provide all the things that we have, and we are only just stewards of what you have given to us. They are not our possessions. In giving back to you these gifts for your work and your service, we give you thanks to be able to participate in that. And we give you the glory and honor and praise for where they are used and how they are used to give, bring your message to people. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'm going to follow. I'm trusting you, God. You are good. I can be crazy, wild and amazing. I'm trusting you, God. You are good. I take each day like anything can happen. Every day to see what's next. A faceless world with wonder and excitement. It's a day. You lead me, I'm gonna follow. I'm trusting you, God, you are good. And they'll be crazy, wild and amazing. I'm trusting you, God, you are good. You lead me, I'm gonna follow. Trust me. To think about the goodness of the Lord. He gives me everything I need and so much more. So I just want to lift my hands to say that I love Him. I just want to lift my heart in praise. And I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. I want to remember everything that the Lord has done.
coming up and singing. That was great. Thank you. This morning, this morning we continue our uh, four or five week series in Colossians. Uh, so if you would, please stand and I will read our passage for this morning. That is Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15, reading in Jesus' name. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him, 
and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord. And we pray that you will speak to us, Lord, through your law and your gospel this morning, that you'll convict us of our sin, and Lord, encourage us and comfort us with your gospel, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever felt uh, incomplete in some way? I'm sure we all have. For example, if you've lost someone close to you to death, you know that incomplete feeling well. Or if your body has been wearing down with age or through sickness or disease, you too know that feeling. Or if you've spent most of your life wandering here and there and with no real purpose, it seems, you know incompleteness too. That feeling of incompleteness is a constant companion to all of us, though it takes on different forms for each of us. Certainly, as believers, we can all agree that we feel less than whole because of our sinful nature. We struggle as Christians to obey God's word. We struggle to do what's right according to it, but we often fail. We know that. And so that feeling comes again. That feeling of incompleteness is one way that we know our spiritual condition is less than perfect. Now I want you to look at our text for today and notice how many times Paul uses that phrase, in him or with him, right? quite a few times. I think Paul here is trying to point something out to you. He's trying to get you to see that indeed you are complete in Christ. If you are one of his followers, you are complete. Even if you always feel incomplete in some way, Paul is telling us that in Jesus you are whole. Now take a look at verse 6 to begin here. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now this is a familiar admonishment from the apostle. Paul often informs us in his letters about the way we are to live our new lives in Christ. Right? Since we've been transformed by him, we're to live as transformed people. And we have a very helpful tool as our guide, don't we? Right? God's word is more than just a mere book. It's more than adequate for the task of equipping us and bringing us to salvation. We might say God's word is God's power. Let me repeat that. God's word is God's power. It is a living and breathing thing, and the Holy Spirit uses it. He gives life to the one who receives it by faith. So if you count Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Bible to thank. God's gracious word has given you faith and it continues to sustain that new life in you. So living your life according to the word of God then is walking, right? That's what Paul is comparing it to, walking or you might, you might say living in Christ. It's 
through the word of God that you put down roots like a sapling, like a tree sapling. And the more, the more you read God's word, the more you hear God's word, the more your roots sink deeper and deeper into Christ. And these roots entwine around him, and he lives in and through you. You are made complete in him. You are made whole in Jesus and his gospel promises. And it's through this same gospel that Christ continues to work in you, to work that same work that he has begun in you. He builds you up in your faith. He makes sure that you know the essentials of his word. He makes sure that you know truth from error. It's Jesus who gives you all you need to be strong in him, to stand firm. It's Jesus Christ who establishes you in the faith as you are taught his word. Everything is due to Christ. Now, for some of you, you've been a Christian your whole life, as long as you can remember. And you were baptized as an infant, and your parents faithfully taught you the word of God as they raised you. And now, as an adult, you continue. Continue that habit of consuming the nourishment of God's word regularly. And that's fantastic. Be thankful for what Christ has done in you, because that's his work. Others of you may have received Jesus at a later period in life. And after being baptized, you began to grow in your faith as you walked with the Lord. Praise God for his work in your life, too. But some of you may rarely read God's word. Some of you would, frankly, rather be at home right now, sleeping, resting. You know what? God provides the best kind of rest right here in his house as you hear God's word and are reminded of what he has done for you. And if your roots aren't deep and your faith is not being built up, then you're in danger. You, who, by the way, are complete in Christ, if you're a believer, you're in danger of losing what you have in him because your roots are shallow. Why? Well, Paul tells us here in his, in, in his letter to the Colossians that there are many who would take you captive with worldly tactics. There are many. He mentions things like philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition. All, these are all things that appeal to our old nature. All f- things that are attractive to us. But you know what? They're things that the devil and his demons attempt to to use to get you to walk away from Christ. The whole world is full of this type of thing. And if you don't believe me, just go sign up for a class at a college and you'll see for yourself. There's even Christian colleges out there who are taking this sort of bait. And they're teaching things that are not in the Word of God. And it doesn't really even matter what the subject is, right? Because... The devil has sunk his teeth deeply into the world and its philosophy and teachings. I know people personally, uh, people who I grew up with, going to youth group with, who have walked away from the faith because the world has lured them away, trying to be cunning, and, and they've lost sight of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you aren't clinging to, the, clinging to Jesus and his word there's a good chance that you will be completely lost when temptation and false teaching and persecution come. Because it's either the word of God alone that you're clinging to or you're not clinging to anything. If you're adding human philosophy or tradition to God's word or even subtracting from God's word, eventually you'll be led astray. Now look at at verses 9 and 10 here, how Paul Uh, describes Jesus. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Now, what is it that Paul is saying here? Paul is trying to get us to see that Jesus is complete. He's not only 100% man, 
but he is fully God as well. See, the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in the body of a woman named Mary. So he is completely man and completely God. He is unique among all individuals who have ever lived. And that is why you can be complete. See, the fullness of God fills you as you live in the God-man, Jesus. Jesus is above all and he deserves honor and respect. All of it. He is the creator of everything and he has entered into our broken and incomplete world in order to make things whole and perfect again. How did he do that? By his death and resurrection. Now, isn't, isn't that incredible? That was the only way that our world could be made whole and perfect again. Isn't that worth telling somebody about? Now, move on, let's move on to verse 11 here. Once again, Paul starts the same way. Right? He says, In him, that is, in Jesus, also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands. Now, in the Old Testament, God introduced to Abraham the sacrament of circumcision. It was a physical sign of his covenant with him and his descendants. So it came to be that every Jewish male was circumcised on the eighth day of his life, according to the law of Moses. Now, the Gentiles didn't have this covenant with God. And now you, you know what circumcision is. I'm not going to go into a great detail here, but all you need to know is that this was the act of surgically cutting or removing a portion of the flesh from the male. All right? Circumcision was a physical indication that God gave them that he was being gracious to mankind by removing their guilt. Circumcision was the promise that he was being merciful that he would be merciful by providing a remedy for man's sin in the offspring of Abraham, the seed of the woman, Mary. And that promise was completely filled in Jesus. That was the point of circumcision. It was a sign of something greater. Now, but now Paul says that this circumcision that we all have is not done with hands. And yet... The body of the flesh is removed from us, he says. How can this be? What is, what is it that Paul is talking about here? Do you see verses 11 and 12, how Paul is relating this old covenant sacrament of circumcision to the new covenant sacrament of baptism? Right? There's a connection here. Baptism, according to Paul, is an act that God performs without hands whereby he does something far better than circumcision did. In baptism, God doesn't just remove a portion of your flesh, he crucifies you. He puts your old nature, your flesh, to death in his son. And all in the same act, God then buries you and raises you to life again. In other words... You were united with Jesus in your baptism. Let me repeat that. You were united with Jesus in your baptism. You were given faith through God's powerful and effective word, right? Because without the word of God, the sprinkling of water or the dunking in water would be nothing. It's the word of God that makes it effective. In baptism, you were saved for eternity and given the Holy Spirit to guide you. In baptism, you were made complete. Do you see why baptism is so important to you? Baptism is a spiritual, we might say surgical operation that God performs in you. Because in baptism, God uncovers and cuts out the sin in your heart. And then he purifies you, not just outwardly, but inwardly. This was important for you, your baptism, because, as Paul says, you were dead. In verse 13, Paul says, And you who were dead in your trespasses 
and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, that is, Jesus. So, what does dead mean? Dead means dead. Right? Dead means dead. You should, I'm going to get that tattooed on my arm because some people don't understand what dead means. Dead is the absence of life. So what Paul is saying here is that you were spiritually lifeless before. You were covered in the filth of your sin. But then Jesus came. And he made his entrance into history and he lived a completely perfect life, died a completely perfect death, and was raised again, whole and victorious. And in that grand act, Jesus paid for your debt and forgave you you of your sin. And now, in the present, this gospel message is delivered to you in your baptism in the Lord's Supper, and every time you hear the gospel read or, or hear it in church. In other words, the grace and mercy and the forgiveness won for you at the cross is carried to you here and now. You were made alive when you were once dead. Your sin has been taken care of once and for all. Let's move on to verse 14 here. Paul says, God forgave us by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now, in in Jesus' day, when the Romans crucified somebody, they would hang a sign above them explaining why they were being punished in such a terrible way. This was partially meant to deter other people who witnessed the crucifixion from doing the same types of things. For instance, the signs might have read something like this. This man is a rebel against Rome and the emperor. Or it might have read, this man is a thief and murderer. Right? They're, essentially, their criminal record was made public, and now that criminal was paying the penalty of death for it. Now, you might recall what it said about Jesus, right? This is the king of the Jews, because Pilate didn't find him guilty. This is the imagery that Paul is using here in this verse. The sinful record that you had incurred, the law's just accusations against each one of you, the sign that was above your head, Well, the blood of Jesus erased them forever. Now it says, paid in full, or it is finished. Your record had to be satisfied to meet the justice of God, and it was by Christ, who was the Lamb of God. Your debt was forgiven on the cross. In your baptism, you were brought to faith and washed clean of your sin. And now you are victorious because of Christ. What an encouraging image that Paul gives us here as we walk with the Lord. It makes us want to be bold for Christ. To continue to go to him and to make him known to the world. Paul finishes up here in verse 15. He, that is God the Father, Disarm the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, that is, Jesus. Now, because you have the forgiveness of sins, you now also share in the victory won by Jesus over the demonic powers. In Paul's day, when the Romans would defeat an enemy, they would hold a triumphal procession. And in this procession, the defeated armies were publicly paraded through the streets. I imagine they were chained hand and foot, and they would be disarmed of their weapons. They would be stripped of their clothes and armor, and they would be utterly humiliated. And then 
either slavery or execution was their immediate future after that. See, this is what Jesus did to Satan and his armies. Some believe that in Jesus' descent that we, we confess, right, that his descent into hell, this is what was going on. Because the descent into hell was a victorious event. It wasn't part of the punishment that Jesus took. In his descent into hell, Jesus proclaimed the victory over Satan. He made it known to them that he was their conqueror. That he not only defeated them at the cross, but that he would defeat them in his resurrection too. So essentially, Jesus was letting them know that they had been disarmed of their weapon of death. Jesus was letting them know that he had stripped them and would continue to humiliate them with his church. And the only thing left for them now is their final punishment when they are cast into hell at the end of time. See, Jesus is victorious. And yet, we're continually warned over and over again in Scripture that although Satan and his demons are defeated, they're still very dangerous. We are absolutely assured of our victory in Jesus. We just sang about that, didn't we? But if we're, not caref- <clears throat> if we're not careful, he can still tempt us away and draw us away from our Lord and Savior. So we must continue to struggle against him. We must continue to know the truth of God's word, to study it, to read it, to hear it. Because that is how we remain rooted and established in the one true faith. We are complete in Christ. And we are strong when we stand on his word and stand together as a body of believers. So let's be diligent to continue to call upon our Heavenly Father in every time of need and build one another up in Christ. Remembering that Jesus is our strength. And in him alone do we continue to be filled with new life each day. Amen. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus, for giving him to us to be our sacrifice for sin. That in him and through him and with him, Lord, we are complete. We are whole again. We've been reconciled to you. You've saved us and love us. So, Lord, help us to not only share this message, Lord, but to to double down on our studying of your word, to hear it regularly, to to prove that we love it. Because in doing so, Lord, in, in studying your word, Lord, it becomes a part of who we are and we grow closer to you and stronger in our faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song is found in your bulletin on the tan sheet, In Christ Alone. Please stand.
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon, shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.